This is Real Sales Talk. Real sales advice from real sales practitioners. Giving you tips on how to dominate your sales quota are your co host Sean Mitchell and Phil Keen. We don't have a process for referrals at most companies. I go into a company, I say, what's your referral process? They have no, well, what do you mean? I think that, I think that goes back to the premise that why do salespeople suck at prospecting? I mean, number one reason why they suck at prospecting is they don't actually do it. If you are successful and nobody knows in, 2000, in 2016, 20, 2025, you're not successful. If you ever want to find out what's going on in the company, get in the car and spend a day with the top three salespeople. You'll find out in five minutes. Because you can't be a trusted advisor without two things, trust and advice. I mean, you need both of them. What's up, Real Sales Talkers? We have an amazing guest today, Ralph Barcy. You are going to love uh, the content he's going to be able to throw at you here in the next half hour. Uh, Sean and I are, are excited to have him on as a guest. Uh, had a great show last night if you had not had a chance to listen to. Uh, James Pember from uh, Sparta Sales. Awesome content, talks through compensation, talks through uh, gamification, teaching your teams how to, how, to, how to accelerate. So go back and listen to that one. Um, but really, really, we want to jump into it. Ralph, we got, we got a limited amount of time, so let's go after it. What's uh, up, guys? What's up? Hey, Ralph. Good to have you on. Great to be here. So for those that don't know Ralph Barcy, go look up some of his content. Uh, he has, uh, from terms of the way I think about SDRs and, and sales in general, um, really changed the way I, I think of the world. Uh, and he's got some concepts that I wanted to help you guys be introduced to. Uh, but today we're going to talk around finding your A players uh, and then really inspiring them to take that next step or maybe building a manager out of the, those people. Um, so leaving it there, uh, Ralph, in your opinion, when you're finding an A player, what are the things you're looking for inside of a team or maybe what you're hiring for? Kind of initial gut reaction uh, and then we can we can expand on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there, you know, all sales leaders and sales development leaders need to focus on a couple key attributes in order to attract A players to their team. So uh, in my experience, the best uh, players I've had on my team uh, have a very high integrity level. Uh, they have an attitude that just doesn't quit. Uh, uh, they are the ones that when they walk into a room, they actually shine a bright light into the situation and they, uh, they bring life into the room versus suck life out of the room. Uh, they are extremely disciplined. Uh, they are also vulnerable. They know that there's some things that they don't know and uh, they own up to that, And which segues into the final attribute, which is they take ownership. Uh, they don't just say they're going to do something and, and not do it. They actually follow through with what they say they're going to do. So those are some key things that I look for. And if I am in an interview or recruiting uh, phase with candidates that I'm considering, I will ask them to show me what their proven track record looks like. Actually show me your work. Uh, where can I learn more about you outside of your LinkedIn profile and outside of your resume? And typically the ones that can show me that work and show me that proven track record, they're already leaps and bounds ahead of a lot of the uh, candidates that we're considering. So those, those are some things to think about when you're considering A players. What types of, of work are you, can you give some examples of what types of work you're, you're looking for or what types of work sales reps would uh, have created that you'd be interested in seeing? Oh, awesome. Uh, so it's not limited, Sean. So for example, uh, I've hired people uh, who led construction sites, for example, or were major D's or hostesses at restaurants and uh, country clubs. Uh, I've hired uh, people from all walks of life and in all backgrounds. So I think a one thing leaders who are looking for A players need to first do is remove any um, definition, for example, of we must find a, a successful salesperson with a sales background in order to bring them onto our team to win. So I, I really open up and uh, I just look for the, the characteristics I just mentioned in all types of backgrounds. So. Uh, as it relates to their background, though, that's the type of work I'm looking for. So for example, maybe they had a successful paper route when they were in high school. If they can show me how they took that paper route from X to Y in the, in the year or five years that they had the paper route, that's a, that's a good example of showing me uh, the progress they've made while they were in that respective job. 
Yeah, and you have a you have a post. It's probably one of my favorite SDR posts, which is the the best SDRs. Um, they avoid like lack of focus, uh, or they don't suffer from lack of focus. Can you go into that a little bit? For, because I think that defined an A player for me, and and really changed the way that I thought about how an SDR role would work or, or a sales rep role would work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a couple things I would hit on, uh, Phil. One is you know, it's 2017, right? And everybody is glued to this, the phone. And that's okay if you are using it properly. If you are using it uh, while the three of us are having this discussion, for example, and I'm really, really concentrating on this, I'm not focused at all or present to the discussion and to what's going on. So um, one thing is you have to know how to, uh, you have to have the timing rather as to when you're gonna leverage this thing and when you're not. Uh, I am, encouraging the leaders in my organization, for example, to shut down email for two hour blocks and actually focus on the projects at hand or the team meetings at hand, et cetera, and then come back to email later. A lot of times people drive their days based on the emails that they receive. They let their inbox kind of uh, manage their days for them. So uh, it just takes uh, a lot of mindfulness and cognizance around time management, priority management, what matters most, who matters most, and being present to all that. And that's really what focus is all about. It's really concentrating on the moment. It's There's not that a, complicated. Uh, when, when, when we interviewed Anthony Iannarino, he had to say something similar. And yes. his suggestion was that when you get into those time blocks where you're calling, you're prospecting, and you need to focus, uh, he recommends that you just turn off the phone completely or put it on the airplane mode uh, so that those updates are not coming through. And I mean, I struggle with this as well. And and I think that that's incredibly key to be focused for those time blocks. He said, start off with 30 minutes and then, you know, expand that time mm -hmm. as you need to or or break it up into different blocks throughout the day and morning and afternoon. Yeah, that's such sound advice. And uh, Anthony's got a killer new book out. Uh, I didn't know you were going to bring them up, so uh, I have no problem plugging this at all. But it's called The Only Sales Book You'll Ever Need or The Best Sales Book You'll Ever Need. And it's a killer read. Uh, and um, with respect to blocking of the time, uh, one, one, one way or method that uh, has really worked for my teams is what, what I call the bookends approach to your week. So, for example, if you're looking at a Monday through Friday work week, uh, use Monday and Friday as the bookends of the week where you do a lot of administrative stuff. Maybe you can hold your internal meetings or your one-on-ones. You could follow up from emails from the weekend or you could tee up a nice message to your leader to say, hey, look, these are the outcomes I'm after this week. And then you recap it in a recap email on Friday. Here's how I did against the goals I said I would hit. And then on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, seriously, the blinders are on. Everyone in the company is aware that hey, Sean and Phil are really getting after it on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and they're doing nothing but inbound lead follow-up or prospecting into you know, target accounts, et cetera, and people respect your time, and you are completely and totally focused on activity and massive activity. Uh, so that on Mondays and Fridays, when you appear to be a little more chill, everybody kind of gets that, hey, these are the bookends of the week, and it's really, really effective. So I love that. Um, that whole time blocking concept. So I think we did a good job kind of talking briefly a way that you think through, hey, this is, this is the, these are ways to identify an A player and even things that they should be doing on a daily basis if they aren't or, or how do you get them there. So introduce, I guess, the concept of, or if you're a leader, then I think you're an amazing leader. How do you start identifying the A player and leveling them up? What are the actions you're doing for them um, to make them better? Sure. So uh, some of the things I encourage is, uh, well, one thing I encourage uh, the A players is to have two solutions to every problem. So the, the A players are very good at managing up. And oftentimes they'll run into an issue or problem and they need to escalate it up the chain for some guidance or some assistance or some intervention. So I'm constantly encouraging them to come up with two solutions to every problem before you escalate it up the chain. Because what that does is it kind of kicks their critical thinking gears into place 
and they start thinking through the problem themselves. And what we're finding is, you know, nine times out of 10, they're actually solving the issues on their own, which is uh, an attribute of leadership. Uh, they're becoming resourceful as they try to find two solutions to this problem. And even if we don't go with one of those two solutions, it's much better for A players to go to their leaders and say, hey, Phil, you know, I've got this issue. However, I've thought it through and I've spoken to A, B, and C, and we think this might be a path we can take or that might be a path we can take. You know, what's your, what's your approach to this or what's your opinion of this? And leaders respect that much more than somebody going, hey, Phil, I've got this issue. You know, what are you going to do to help me with it? So that's a, that's a big one It's just finding two solutions to every problem. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because you start to teach them immediately that when you have an issue, you need to start solving it right away. Cause there's not, sometimes you're going to be resource constrained depending on the size of your company or even just capacity at a large organization is you might not have an answer every single time. So you have to kick that gear. Um, and eventually if they're going to get into a management role, they need to be the ones that are solving these issues and passing this along. And, and I think it's, I think it's great advice. Here's one of the other things I like about that, Ralph. Um, I think that's really good leadership grooming that you're having them create those two potential solutions because um, what that does for you as a leader is it, it if you're if you're right in the middle of something, they come in and say, hey, I've got this thing and here are a couple of options. It allows you to, to help them problem solve quicker mm -hmm. because um, you're probably not thinking about that one thing that they're dealing with. You're thinking about 10 other things mm -hmm. and pulled into that particular situation. So um, I think it probably helps you and that sales rep come to a final conclusion uh, because they're recommending two, two solutions. That's right. You know, my, my friends at Topo here in the Bay Area, Scott Albro and Craig Rosenberg, uh, often tout that specificity wins. So uh, when, when my team or my leaders come to me and they're very specific and detailed about the problem at hand, and they did show that, um, that leadership by trying to solve through it themselves, uh, it just makes everyone's life easier. They may not have the answer when they do come to me, and I may not have the answer either. But as you two know, leaders get to the positions they're in because what they've done is just solved problem after problem after problem. And they've had difficult conversation after difficult conversation, and they've faced the music, and they've provided a, you know, a, a, not only a solution, but an action plan to, to go right through that problem towards the solution. So yeah, you're right. 100%. Yeah. I think you start, you start to formulate, help them think through the critical thinking side of it, but you give them a cushion you give them a, a safe place to do that in, um, which is interesting. So introduce to the, the audience kind of your thought process around this servant leadership. Cause I think that gives people an idea of the way that you think. Uh, and then it, we can go back into how do I start developing these people further? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I appreciate you bringing this one up, Phil. It's near and dear to my heart. So it just starts with an image of, you know, your traditional org chart. And uh, typically the leaders at the top of that org chart. And uh, what I like to do is see that org chart inverted. So I see myself at the very bottom of the org chart actually serving up into my organization. And uh, just from experience, I know that everyone on that team in my organization will at one point become alumni of my, of my team. And they're going to go out into the world, into the marketplace, and into the ecosystem from which we work. And they're going to represent me. And they're going to represent my brand. And they're going to represent the times that they had on our team and in our organization. And of course, you want them to represent that well. And you want them to represent themselves well. I also uh, admit regularly that life is a series of temporary events. So I know that everyone on my team at some point will be off my team. So I have a very finite amount of time to work with them and to develop their natural born strengths and gifts that they bring to the table. And it's my job as a leader to tease out those strengths and gifts so that everyone in my organization can really shine in their own right. So I work very hard on really removing obstacles from their path so that they can shine and get to where they need to go. And that might not be on my team or in our company. And I am okay with that as long as they put skin in the game and they were contributors of value when they were on my team and in our organization. That's really all that matters. And, and I clearly want them to do good in the world. And I want them to uh, spread that leadership and pay things forward so that others can do it. So, uh, you know, that's the approach I really take. 
uh, on a daily basis. In fact, um, I have a pretty long commute into my office in Santa Clara uh, from where I live. And on a daily basis, when I'm driving to the office, uh, you know, I'm a pretty faith-filled guy and I'm usually asking God to just use me as a channel to do good work and to make sure that I'm uh, enabling my people to do their best as well. And if that means I need to kind of remove myself from some processes or uh, remove obstacles from their paths, so be it. I, because I really want uh, everybody to give it their best shot and do their best work. So I think it's really important for the audience to understand that you're, you're a practitioner and love being a practitioner of what you're talking about. Can yep. you give me maybe a so we get a little more tactical? Can you give me an example of when you've been able to overcome some obstacles for somebody and, and what actually led to at the end of it? Like, or is there a shining example in your head? Um, th so there's, there's so many, Phil, it's tough to, to isolate one. So I guess a little background for context for, for our listeners and viewers. Uh, I am the senior director of the worldwide sales development organization at ServiceNow. So today there's 130 people in my organization. They're in seven offices around the world. About 100 of them are sales development reps and the remaining 30 are either frontline managers or they're directors of their respective regions. So uh, the issues I discuss on a daily basis really run the gamut. Uh, there are personnel issues, there are compensation issues, there are process issues, technology and sales stack issues. Uh, there are all the different stakeholders that we serve within our organization, account executives, field marketers, marketing and demand gen, et cetera, et cetera. So to find that one shining example where I've been able to remove an obstacle and let somebody shine, it's that's gonna be a tough one to try to wrap my head around to, uh, to give right here in this talk. You know, I hate to let you down. It's good. I, I thought I'd ask. No, it's a great question. And if it, it may come to me in five minutes and I'm, I'm happy to interrupt and share the example, but I can't think of one. Uh, Ralph, you talked about helping draw out those, those skills and opportunities within, within sales reps. Do you, and, and any, any, any sales leader is going to create opportunities for that moments yeah. where those teachable moments can, can be had what sort of moments do you typically encounter that? Is it, is it the one-on-one? -on -one? Is it the sales meeting? Is it, you know, do you take your, your sales reps out to lunch? Uh, when do those moments happen for you? Yeah, so um, I can come up with a pretty good example of this one, uh, Sean. It's what it is, is I had a rep at one point, just he, he was really fired up and excited to get from the sales development rep role to an account executive role. And he was really, really getting after it. And he showed me a notebook or three ring binder that he had created with the, with the tabs and everything on objection handling and conversation starters and negotiation. And he decided to show me the binder. So that was a great example for me to encourage him to schedule a lunch and learn with his colleagues. Anybody who wanted to come at lunch and sit for an hour and listen to what he was doing in his role uh, were welcome. Uh, he may experience one or two attendees in that first lunch and learn, but I'll tell you, if he is adding value to those two people, they're gonna tell their peers, hey, you're gonna want so-and-so to do a lunch and learn again, and you're gonna wanna attend this next one. The dude was spitting gold and wisdom to us and dropping knowledge left and right, and that's how it starts. You know, you enable your reps, for example, to do a lunch and learn or to write an article, as we talked about earlier, you need to show your work. And if you're really doing good work, share it with the marketplace by way of a video like this or an article, or if you wanna grab a bunch of stakeholders and create your own webinar, go ahead and do that. The technology allows us all to do that very easily today. Those are some those are some examples of how the A players can really differentiate themselves and really level up what they're doing. Hope that helps. No, I mean, it's great. And, I, and like my example, as you start talking about it, if you guys don't know, uh, there's a, a man named Morgan J. Ingram. He'll know what that means. Um, but obviously, you got to get up on his, on his uh, SDR Chronicles. Look up the SDR Chronicles. I think that's a good example that the world can see uh, of an SDR that kind of took what he's doing on a daily basis and and put himself in a position where it's, I just need to tell the world what I'm doing and what I'm working on. Uh, and he's gotten validation from a lot of people because of it. Uh, but that's a good example. And, and it's not from your organization, but it's, it's, it's where my mind immediately went. 
Um, Morgan's the man. Uh, so that's a guy who does what he says he's going to do. So uh, for for background, those who don't know the story, I I published an article maybe maybe a year and a half, two years ago now on Sales Hacker, and I actually threw down the gauntlet and I challenged the sales development reps in the world to start their own YouTube channel made by an SDR specifically for SDRs with SDR content. And Morgan is the only one who took me up on that challenge. And to date, I think has 40 something episodes in the books. And I'm gonna be there on the 100th episode. Uh, we've talked from the outset that when he hits 100 episodes, I'll be there. And I can't wait, I'm really excited for Morgan. And it really is derived from the concept that the more value you add to the marketplace, the more valuable you become in the process. So add value to the marketplace, stop thinking about yourself and start facing outward and start teaching what you are learning. Uh, it's really important that while you're learning stuff and while you're reading content, books that Anthony has written, for example, that we just talked about, that you're, you're taking notes as if you need to teach someone what you're learning the very next day. And when you develop that mindset and when you work on that craft, incredible things are gonna happen and you will find yourself becoming way more valuable in the marketplace and you get to a point where you've hustled so much you no longer have to introduce yourself. And in sales, that's critical to get to that level where you are avoiding obscurity, you're putting nothing but value into the ecosystem. So all of a sudden your phone starts ringing and you're starting to attract opportunities versus pursue them. So I'm glad you brought up Morgan because he's doing a fabulous job. I didn't realize that that was the, that you were the, the genesis of that. I remember we've had him on the show. We had him on in August of 2016 and he told this story and it just clicked that uh, uh, it was, it was you that he was listening to. So it's cool to see that, that come full circle uh, and, and to see the genesis of, of the, uh, the SDR Chronicles. So really, really cool. Cool. Yeah, it's good stuff. And uh, we'll talk more about it on the 100th episode. But I mean, he straight up tweeted me with a video that I'm happy to share, uh, where he just said online, hey, I'm your guy. I'm the one who's going to do this, this video channel, you know, just watch me do it. And I mean, he, he went and did it. He took action. And I love it. Got me all yeah. fired up. So so we talked about attributes you look for. We talked about the way that you think about leadership and then really the things that you're, you're going to kind of push them towards so they, they start proving out that they are an A player. So talk to me about how do you start developing skills for them to take the next level? So if their next level is management, what are the things you're helping them go towards? Or if it's account executive or, or an account mm -hmm. manager, role, what, what are the things you're trying to get in front of them um, so that they're set up for success? Because ultimately they're your alumni. Yeah, I appreciate that. So uh, first and foremost uh, is really the mindset of thinking about and serving others and really not focusing on yourself. When you become a manager of people, for example, it's just not about you anymore. It's only about them. So that takes people a while to adjust to, uh, to that way of thinking. Uh, so I'm a big believer in and proponent of the teachings of John Wooden. Uh, the former late coach of UCLA Bruins basketball team. And what John talks about in his book, Wooden on Leadership, is that he focuses so much on each individual rep on his team doing their best versus the team doing its best that he no longer had to look at the scoreboard or talk to the team about winning a game. He knew that if he was getting optimal uh, use out of every rep on his team, that they were bringing the best version of themselves to every scenario, then they just didn't have to worry about the score anymore. So I am always encouraging up and coming leaders, uh, regardless of the role, whether it's to AE or a team leader or a manager, uh, to start focusing on the individuals on their team. So I mentioned earlier, I have 130 people in my organization today. I do everything I can to get to know every individual person in my organization. So if I am in Singapore, for example, where one of our teams resides, I will make sure that I carve out one-on-one -on -one time with every single rep in the Singapore office to try to learn about what results they're after, professionally and personally, uh, what their passions are and what they think their purpose is, so that if they're having a rough day or a rough quarter, there are triggers that I can leverage 
to remind them of the purpose that they shared with me or some of the results that they are after. And they usually get right out of that funk and right back on track. So I talk about stuff like that with the up and comers about really focusing on the individuals and taking advantage of um, that one-on-one -on -one time that, that we all have instead of opening the laptop and looking at metrics and dashboards, which are very important uh, you don't have to do that every single time. In fact, go outside, get some air, let the guard down, get some oxygen, and start having real dialogue with the humans that your team's comprised of. And it goes yeah. a really long way. I think it's interesting that whenever you were talking through that, there's actually a book, I know you're an avid reader, so maybe you've read it, yep. is The Dream Manager. Um, yep. if you're familiar with it. And it kind of goes at the concept of organization and, and rather than working on what your company goals are it's figuring out what they're looking for so it's it, they go into like a manufacturer and and that's the setting of it and there's a woman who really just wants to get home and not have to wait at the bus stop because she's not safe she wants a car and that's why she goes to work every day and, and you as a leader have a duty to understand that and why she does it and to help them get to that goal because they'll forever be grateful for why that or why that is or maybe it's I need a house because I have a family and I never had a house and that's my goal ultimate life goal is to do this yeah. Um, so if you guys have not read Dream Manager, uh, I really recommend it because it kind of gets you into that servant leadership style, but it also gets you into there. You come to work for a reason, and it's not just you; it's your people. Like, there's a reason why Ralph comes to work every day. Yeah, uh, he knows what it is. It's internal. Yeah, and it's it's another thing that's tough for a lot of new leaders is you. I mean, you have to lead with love, guys. You really do. You have to have you know authentically and genuinely and sincerely, you got to want the best for the people on your team. And you absolutely have to start with putting a 10 on everyone's forehead and let them be the ones to take that 10, do a two, uh, but don't prejudge them. Uh, give them the benefit of the doubt. Try to get to know them better. It's a great quote from Abraham Lincoln. You know, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. Just take that philosophy and that concept that, to heart. Uh, when you are leading people and just get to know your team and to your point, Phil, when you get to know like what it is that they're aspiring to become uh, by coming to work every day, uh, you might be able to help move some things out of the way to get them where they need to go. And uh, they'll be forever grateful. Uh, you will befriend someone else and uh, they'll pay it forward uh, and they'll help others in the process uh, as they become leaders. That's really incredible, and and I, I wish we had more time to dive into some of these topics because there's so much, in particular, servant leadership. I don't think there's enough people talking about this, and um, uh, we'll have to have you on again to to dive specifically in into this particular topic, but uh, we want to thank you, Ralph, for being on the show. You've dropped some really, really great ideas, some great nuggets, and some things for for not only sales leaders, but also sales reps to consider. So um, looking forward to uh, getting this one out to our audience. Um, how can people connect with you if they want to uh, follow what you're doing? Sure. Well, thank you, Sean. And thank you, Phil, for having me. It was awesome. I would love to come back and pick up where we left off. Uh, people can uh, learn about me at ralphbarsi.com. It's R-A-L-P-H-B-A-R-S-I.com. And if you click subscribe, uh, you won't get blasted with spam. In fact, you'll get one personalized email. I don't do the auto email responder. I keep it real. And in that one email, I will give you a boatload of the content that I have published over the years. Uh, and my intent is for you to grab just one nugget of value from that content and share it if you like it. So that's probably the best way to reach me. On Twitter, I'm at rbarcy. I'm on LinkedIn. It's uh, Ralph Barcy is the link to follow. And uh, I'm also... Uh, reachable uh, on Gmail. It's rbarcy at gmail.com. I'm an early adopter, so I got that cool email handle. But thanks for having me, guys. Really, I love talking about this stuff, and we could probably go for a couple hours on it. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks again, Ralph, and um, we'll see you all, Real, Real Sales Talk audience, on the next episode. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ralph.